Okay, Groovesters and Groove Stars, Ridgely here, and I am super excited to welcome a very, very dear friend who for over four decades has been the best-selling author and founder of Yes to Success, despite how young she still is and looks and resembles. It's been a long time. So many of the gurus in the personal development, personal growth space are in fact her students, your students, and they have used your formula to become uber successful, mega millionaires, successful entrepreneurs, etc. It is such an honor and delight to be hanging out with my friend and mentor, Deborah Poneman. Deborah, I'm so happy that you're here with the Groove community. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this. I do a lot of interviews, but I woke up this morning. Oh, I get to play with Ridgely. <laughs> Yeah, that guy, that weird guy, right? So, wow, it's been like amazing. You've been at this for so long. I mean, before we get started, just so that everybody gets a chance to experience your magnificence, tell us a little bit about your journey. Oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> uh, I can't do a little, but I'll do a medium amount about my journey. <laughs> okay, so, perfect. Basically, uh, I became a meditation teacher in the 1970s. You could start calculating how old I am. That's okay. I don't mind. Uh, <laughs> and um, after uh, teaching meditation full time, one day I was, um, well, actually, I lived in a meditation community. And one day I realized that woman does not live by mantra alone because I was flat broke. You know, it was a nonprofit and, and I thought, you know, I don't have a car. I don't have health insurance. I don't have car insurance. I don't have any of that stuff. And I'm pushing the big three O. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go where people make money. And I thought, where are the people who are really wealthy? Los Angeles. <laughs> so I picked myself up from my meditation community in the middle of Iowa and I moved to Los Angeles and I started selling investments because that's how I thought people made money. Well, I was, you know, a dismal failure, but we know that what we think we're doing something for is usually not why we're really doing it. So I thought I was moving to LA to sell investments, but it turned out that one night I was at work and one of my colleagues, um, by the way, I never sold one investment except to my dad, but God bless his heart. But anyway, <laughs> so he invites me to the learning annex and it was going to be a money seminar. I thought, okay, maybe I'll learn something that will help me be better at what I'm trying to do. And I walk in and it's not the usual suits it's the new age community and this was 1980 and the guy was talking about the law of attraction and he's talking about how your mind creates your reality and he says that we're like tuning forks and whatever her vibration is it's impossible to draw anything except they like vibration to it if you're vibrating a b flat you repel an f sharp and he said if you're always talking about how poor you are and you're never going to get out of debt and you're never going to be successful in life it sucks then that's what you're vibrating. And that is the only thing that you're going to be able to draw into your life. And you also said that the way to become wealthy and successful is to help other people become wealthy and successful. And you can even do that with your thoughts, sending them wishes for success and prosperity instead of thinking that person's really a jerk because, you know, as you sow, so shall you reap and all of these incredible concepts. And I was on fire. Every cell in my body was vibrating with the truth of what this guy was saying. And the other thing he said is that if you're not sure what you want to do with your life, write down, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the things that make you happy. Excuse me. I'm going to mute myself for a second. It's all right. You don't want to hear that. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So he said, make a list of all of the things that make you happy. So I wrote, he said, don't think of a career. So I wrote down that I like to talk. I like to travel. I like to be with people who I love. I like to laugh until I cry and cry until I laugh. And, um, and I want to be on TV and I, and I love writing. And I went to bed and I woke up with, in the morning and I knew exactly what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I woke up my then husband, you know, I always forget his name, but I do remember his name is Mark. Nice guy. But anyway, I woke him up and I said, I know what I'm doing for the rest of my life. I'm going to do what the, the guy at the learning annex did does. I'm going to teach people how to use the power of their mind to create success. 
And I did. And so the question is, well, was I successful at it? Well, the truth is, is that I became successful almost out of the shoot because I used the principles that I was studying in order to create my success. For example, you want a few of them? Yes, please. Okay. We do. We my do. My favorite one is that an idea comes to you because it is needed on the planet at this time for creation to progress and you are the best candidate to bring that idea forth. You're given your ideas because you're the best person to fulfill that idea. The universe is not random. I never had the idea to be like a concert pianist. I have no musical talent, but somebody else might want to be a rock star because they have the talent. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. I didn't have the idea to start a leadership development program for, for a digital community or start a company that offers digital products. You know, you'd have to slowly explain to me what even a digital product means, although I do know what funnels are because <laughs> I use them. <laughs> but if you don't act on your idea because it's needed at this time, it's going to go to someone else who will. Mm -hmm. OK, mm -hmm. so the idea came to me to teach the principles of creating success. So an idea comes to you because you are I mean, if we want to get cosmic eyes that say the creator looks down and thinks, OK, who is going to take my idea because it needs to be done on the planet right now and do a good job? I'll you know, do it. it. Okay. Yeah. And we're here right now at this moment because of the very principle of which you speak, because I got a whisper. I got a whisper. And I said, I need to call Mike Filsane. I think Groove Digital could really benefit from a leadership development program. And I offered the idea to Mike, to which Mike promptly responded, are you volunteering? And that was the beginning of Groove Growth as we know it today. As we are speaking right now, it was the idea that came, that whisper that came exactly like you're talking about. And then I just picked up the phone and acted on the idea. And, and that's now I'm going to tell you why people have ideas and they never come to fruition because they start sharing their ideas with other people who have nothing to do with it, in this case, nothing to do with Groove Growth, and you bump up against the discouragement committee, those yeah. people are gonna tell you all the reasons why Groove does not need you. And, you know, there's enough leadership and there, you know, seminars, they could just go on the internet and all of the reasons why your idea won't work. So what I say, my friends, do not share your ideas when they are tiny seeds that could easily be crushed by the discouragement committee. That's because exactly. what you want to do is you want to move forward with your idea, share them with the right people, not your, you know, your mother and your father and your, you know, your spouse or all of those people who are historically negative about your ideas. Why would you do that to yourself? Mm -hmm. And yeah. the other thing is what is sacred must be kept secret. And if you have an idea, it is your sacred idea. Sacred and secret come from the same root. And another reason we don't share our ideas with to the wrong people is because every time you share it, people, oh, wow, that's a great idea. It's like getting letting the steam out of the kettle. You got to let that steam build up. When I had the idea to start my Yes to Success company, I didn't tell anybody except for my husband, my then husband, my wonderful husband, Mark, I do remember his name. And I told him, but I didn't tell <laughs> anybody else because I was reading that you do not want to risk bumping up against the discouragement committee. And you don't want to keep letting the steam out of the kettle. Let it build up. It has to birth, burst forth into your idea. And the other thing in the fruition of your idea, the other thing is don't wait until everything is perfectly in place because we live in a relative universe and there will always be loose ends okay mm -hmm. i mean you know i'll do it when the kids start school i'll do it when the kids finish school i'll do it when i get the inheritance i do it when i get the divorce i'll do it when i get no because as soon as that happens there's going to be another loose end that's going to pop up mm -hmm. so what you have to do is just you know put on your big girl or your big boy panties and take a step from which there is no turning back and mm -hmm. that's what i did I went out, this is 1980, so I went out and I rented a room at the Santa Monica Public Library 
and I put up posters because that's what we did in 1980. There was no internet. You know, <laughs> Deborah Olson to teach seminar on success. And by the way, I had no credentials. The only thing I did my entire life was teach meditation and was a failure at selling investments. But the idea came to me. So I just had to take that step from which there is no turning back. And when I put up the posters, then the discouragement committee said, what? Your mind creates your reality. That's ridiculous. Nobody's going to believe that. But the posters were already up. I had taken that step and I walked into the room at the Santa Monica Public Library and there was standing room only. And within a few short years, my seminar was being taught in seven countries on four continents, which might not sound like a lot now, but there is no internet. That was snail mail, mail and phones that were connected to your wall. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is so much fun. I can tell you when I first moved to Spain, when I was a youth, a youth, when I was a youth, and we got a phone call from the United States, somebody had to run down to the house and say, hey, you're going to get another call in 25 minutes. Come up to this thing. And they were pulling them out of the socket and pushing them back into the socket and doing this whole thing. But somehow it worked yeah, just like that, it worked for you. That's right. And that's how I, I ran a business on seven on four continents, seven countries in the 1980s. And I just want to say one other thing. The other reason why I was able to be so successful is what we're talking about today. Attitude is everything. And again, I was a product of the product of all the great masters. What I did after I told my, my then husband, Mark, that I was going to start this company, I went to the library and I got every book I could by the great masters, Napoleon Hill and Wallace Waddles and Emmett Fox and, and Clement Stone and Catherine Ponder and, um, you know, James Allen, who wrote um, uh, As a Man Thinketh. You know, mm -hmm. as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And there isn't one thing. I mean, there's so many things in common, all those thinkers. But the number one thing they all have in common is that everything in your life is determined by the thoughts you think. Yeah, right. I remember when I was working with Jim Rohn, he would talk a lot about your personal philosophy. And he would say to all of us on a regular basis, your thoughts create your actions. Your actions determine your results. Where do your thoughts come from? Your personal philosophy. So stop thinking about all that stuff and work on your personal philosophy. What is that? I love that man. I love him. Such a great mentor to me. Yes, Jim Rohn, one of the all-time greats. You know, I was his voice in Spanish, right? Say that again. I am, I am Jim Rohn's voice in Spanish. So when you buy oh, books on Jim Rohn, they're in my voice. In Spanish? Uh-huh. Yep. <laughs> you are kidding. I had no idea. He was actually one of my, I never, actually, I did meet him once, but he was one of also the people that I read in the early days, Earl Nightingale. Remember Bob Proctor? Been of around course. Forever. Zig Ziglar, yeah. you know, Jim yeah. Rohn was one of the all-time greats. Wow. Yeah, I had traveled all over Latin America with Jim. We'd stand side by side on a Spanish stage and he'd speak in English and I'd speak in Spanish and he'd speak in English and I'd speak in Spanish and he'd tell a joke and I would go, uh-oh, how do I do that? <laughs> I, <mean. laughs> I spent many years, a number of years with Jim traveling everywhere. So I had a chance to soak that in and put that thought out into the world. Our personal philosophy determines our thoughts that determine our actions. And no wonder we like each other so much. <laughs> all right Doug. so now it's the 80s and then what okay so oh yes so now it's the 80s and i start my seminar and i'm teaching it all over the world and it is incredibly successful and as you said many of today's renowned transformational leaders were my students um marcy shimoff was my secretary janet atwood was my personal assistant <laughs> Deepak Chopra was one of my students. And um, as you may or may not remember from my story in 1988, I, I gave it all up because one of the things that I teach is to um, follow your heart and to be true to yourself and do what makes your heart sing. And in 1988, something happened. And what I was doing didn't make my heart sing so much anymore as my baby girl. And right. um, so when she was born, I decided, well, new passion. And the thing is, is that we 
all were put on earth for a purpose. And there are people who are waiting. Their contract in this lifetime is for their life to be changed by you. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And if you follow your heart and you take, you know, a year off to go hold AIDS babies in Uganda, or you take a year off to, to uh, work on a political campaign or be at your grandmother's side while she's making her transition, your purpose for being on earth is not going to be going away. And in my case, I took 20 years off to be a mom at home with my babies, with my, my daughter. And then three years later, my son was born. And 20 years later, not only was my career still waiting for me, but I had had the richness of the experience of being with my children. We also had foster kids and you know the whole story, lots of kids living in my house. But it not only enriched my life, but it enriched my teachings because I can share, I could draw from that part of my life experience to um, even make what I'm teaching more powerful. And um, so that's it. So that, and I'll tell you something else. One of the other things that I always teach in Yes to Success is Treat everybody as the most important person in the world mm -hmm. because they might be your secretary or they might be your personal assistant, but mm -hmm. they also then might be the number one woman nonfiction bestselling author of all times. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I was handed a bestselling book to write, I wrote Chicken Soup for the American Idol Soul. Two reasons, and these are two great reasons. One is, because when Marcy came, Marcy Shymoff came up to me at one of my early seminars and she said, I want to work for you. I want to work for you. I didn't think, who is this person? <laughs> Tiny little thing, cute as can be, college student. I gave her my full attention. I treated her like she was the most important person in the world because the person standing in front of you at any given moment is the most important person in the world. I didn't look around the room to see if there's somebody else more important than this young college student to talk to. Because I actually believe that if you do God's work on earth, which is treating everybody as the precious jewel that they are, then the God of your understanding will take care of whoever else in the room you might have found to talk to while being rude to the person in front of you. I hope you followed that. But anyway, the bottom line is that I went off to raise my kids. And while I was at Chuck E. Cheese, she was busy becoming the number one nonfiction best-selling woman author of all time, selling over <laughs> almost 20 million chicken soup books. And when somebody asked her to, to write chicken soup for the American Idol Soul, she was under contract for Happy for No Reason. They said, well, do you know anybody else who knows American Idol backwards and forwards and who is a great writer? And she said, I know exactly. And I was handed a best-selling book to write, which is one of the things I wrote down on my goals that very first night. And, um, but one of the other reasons is because I followed my heart and I was a mom at home. And what do you do with your tweens besides watch American Idol every Tuesday and Wednesday night? <laughs> <laughs> so again, all of those following your heart, treating everybody as the most important person in the world, you know, and also you're not the general manager of the universe, which is an expression I learned from Janet Atwood. There's a high- Oh yeah, I resigned from that gig. I resigned from that gig. That's right. a good gig to resign from because so many of us want to be the general manager of the universe, but I'm telling you, that ain't no job nobody needs. I'm just saying. <laughs> You <laughs> just saying, brother, and you just gotta surrender that job to somebody who can do a lot better job than you. No, 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 no. don't want that job. Yeah, wow. and the more you surrender and surrender and surrender, and and also have gratitude. You now, I always say to people, you have gratitude for the good, and you have gratitude for the not so good. That's where the optimism comes in. That's where the positive attitude comes in. It's easy to have gratitude when you get the big speaking gig, or you get the big contract, or, or you put something on on the internet, and a thousand people show up to your event, or ten thousand people show up to your event. But if you put it out on the internet, and five people show up to your event, I say, always give gratitude. Because if you're like, why, what did I do wrong? What was, I'm not that you don't course correct, but oh, what was me? You contract yourself. But when you say thank you, knowing that we live in a benevolent universe, knowing that things do not happen to you, they always happen for you. And if you give gratitude, then the gift in it is going to be revealed to you much more quickly. So 
I don't know. Why did I go off on that tangent? But I don't know. But I got a couple things. I got a couple things for you. So first off, I really love that point of putting your full attention on the person right in front of you. And um, before I go to my other point that I want to bring up, I learned that from my spiritual leader also. Watching him, he leads 12 million people, 12 million. And yet when he's talking to somebody, the rest of the world just doesn't exist. And he has such enormous respect from everyone because of that thing. And how many of us have been in the situation where we're looking around to see, is this the person I should be talking to? Or is there a better one over there? Is there a better one over this place? Or maybe I've been right. be networking with this yeah, thing. Right. Like Jack Canfield in the room. <laughs> Exactly. And, and all many of these guys are our mutual friends. Right. And we and uh, <laughs> I have so many stories. We're not going down that rabbit hole. I know, but that's what I mean. It's like people, you know, they're look, they're talking to you and all of a sudden somebody like, you know, a Jack Canfield or a Lisa Nichols or, you know, Marianne Williamson. It's like, oh, my God, could I have a chance to talk to them? And that ain't how it works. Mm -mm. No, that ain't how it works. I love that. Just stay focused on the person in front of you. Give them everything you've got and you'd be amazed at what happens. Now, I just got to get back to the, this part because the story is so fascinating that sometimes the point behind the story can be missed a little bit. So I want to elaborate just a skosh because there are very few people who, when they are at the top of their game. About to have, have my own daytime TV talk show, I might yeah. add. <laughs> yeah. Right. About to have your own and, daytime TV. And, so, you know, and so, Janet Atwood is my witness because she was there at the meeting taking notes for me as my secretary. I love Janet. She's great. So so literally. You're at the top of the game, 100 percent, and you took a 20 year hiatus. To be mom. I just want to make sure everybody heard that that it didn't slide by anybody. So Deborah took a 20 year hiatus to be mom. And there are stories that I we could regale you with, I, just the ones I remember I could regale you with of, of Deborah's experience as mom. And then took all of that, the richness of that experience, the depth of that experience and brought it out and put yourself right back in the game as if you never left for a second. That's like kind of crazy. And I just want for, especially for all of us who've been like, oh, I became an overnight success after working really hard for 25 years or 10 years or 15 years or whatever, to have that ability to do that. And obviously I know you talk so much about our thoughts create our reality, but talk to us a little bit about that, about how, what I want to know, like at the end of the 20 years, when you're finally Okay, my son has now grown up and it's time for me to get back in the game. What did that look like? How'd you even do that? So many things and thank you because actually you don't know this, but I actually didn't finish the thought. And the thought was when I came back after 20 years, all of those people who I treated as the most important people in the world when they didn't, I wouldn't say they were nobody because nobody is nobody. Everybody is incredible, but they didn't have any like credentials like best-selling author. But when I came back and all of my, not all of my, but many of my students now were contenders, you know, I mean, they were there to mm -hmm. get me speaking gigs. Marcy asked me to join you in your year of miracles that became an international phenomenon. And it was, it still is one of the fastest growing self-improvement programs on the planet. Is mm -hmm. when she had the idea in 2013, who did she think of to be mm -hmm. her partner? It was mm -hmm. me. And again, you know, my Angelo says that, you know, people don't remember what you say, but they will always remember how you made them feel. So people remember that. But the other thing is speaking of Janet Atwood, uh, they're my two best friends. So I got to keep referring to them. But, um, <laughs> but um, I remember one day Janet came to me. She says, Debbie, call me Debbie. When are you going to stop pretending your kids still need you and get back on the speaking circuit? And I remember thinking, 
that I don't know if my kids ever really needed me. I mean, a lot of great kids, and I'm not saying everybody should be a mom at home. There are a lot of great kids that have been raised by nannies and, and grandmas and aunties and foster parents. But so it wasn't that I thought my kids needed me so much, but to, I didn't want to let go, you know, because mm -hmm. to me, one, I love you, mommy, is worth more than a thousand standing ovations. So I, wanted to hold on to that as long as I could. But you know, another thing is your kids love seeing you succeed. They love seeing me up on the stage. They love, you know, that's my mom. And so I, I just had to let go. But because of what I had done for people 20 years before, they remembered. And it was really easy for me to, to start. Where, but the other thing is that we are all put on earth for a purpose. You have been given natural talents. I've always been a speaker. Some of you have always been writers. Some of you have always been artists. Some of you have always been healers. My daughter's a chiropractor. She was When she was two years old, we would have her come and lay hands on us. So, but if you take off five years, 10 years, 20 years, your dharma what you were put on earth to do is not going to go away. It's going to be waiting for you as long as you follow your heart. As a matter of fact, that is the only way there to your ultimate destination. Mm -hmm. and, you know, can I share one other story about when I, because people say, oh, didn't you ever doubt yourself? <laughs> no, no, you can't share another story. Not on my show. I'm just <laughs> That's what we're here for. Of course, you can okay. hear another story. We want to hear another story. Well, I'm going to tell you a story because people say, didn't you ever um, doubt yourself when uh, when all of your friends were becoming best-selling authors? And and yeah, like I'd hear, oh, they're having their big book launch party in New York and, you know, with their little, you know, warm brie with, you know, walnuts and honey on, and I'm a Chuck E. Cheese eating pizza that tastes like cardboard, you know, <laughs> it's like, what was I thinking? But I, but I loved my kids and I loved being a mom and, you know, I didn't stay at home and sew their clothes and churn my own butter, but I loved it. It was fun. It's like, you get to relive your childhood through your kids. You're at the basketball games and you're the backstage mom, the field trip mom that, you know, you get to do all those things from a different perspective, but I remember one day when my kids were exceptionally out of sorts, they were like two and four at the time or two and five at the time. And usually I didn't put them in front of the TV, but this was definitely a TV day. True story. I put them on the couch. They want to watch Barney, that big purple dinosaur thing. And I'm like, all right, fine. You can watch Barney. And so I'm doing this channel check while I'm looking for Barney. As I sit here, I go through the channels and I see Oprah. And there is Oprah interviewing one of my students mm -hmm. who now has a best-selling book. And he is demonstrating for Oprah the power of the mind using a, um, kind of this demonstration that I had cognized in a meditation. And she is flipping out over it. And I want to say God bless him for doing it because I know it changed thousands and tens of millions of lives. How many people watch that episode of, of Oprah and they saw mm -hmm. the power of their mind to, to even move matter. But here he is with Oprah going, oh my God, that's the most amazing thing. I, I, I just can't even believe it. I can even do it. He gets Oprah and I get these two whiny kids on the couch and I burst into tears standing in front of the TV. And I'm like, oh, and at that moment I thought I have ruined my life. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> ruined my life I will never have a chance again Oprah knows everything now <laughs> and um and and I'm literally sobbing in front of the tv which is good because it startled my children so much that they stopped whining and the only thing that really like kind of shocked me out of my self-imposed stupor was when or woke me on my self-imposed pity party was when my daughter says to me mommy I go yes sweetheart she goes I think you forgot our popsicles. <laughs> Let's bring it back to real, shall we? Let's just get real for a second. It promised the popsicles. So I find Barney, I go into the kitchen, but I'm mad at God. I'm pouring the orange juice into the plastic molds because I promised them I'd make them, you know, I'd make them orange juice popsicles. And I'm mad at God. Like that was supposed to be me. 
You know, I had my TV show. I was about to sign the contract when I got pregnant, you know? And um, so I like, why did you do this to me? And I got this message from God. You know, when I say message from God, it's not like God's like, you know, Deborah, you know, like Charlton Heston, you know, in the 10 commandments, <laughs> Deborah, remember. And, but, but I got this little message, remember the book. And I was like, yeah, I do remember the book. I also didn't mention this. My book was in the hands of a major New York publisher when I decided to be a mom at home. Anyway, I digress. So this message from God is remember the book. And I remembered a book I had read about somebody who had died and gone to the other side and came back and wrote a book and told the story. And um, he said, he tells him the story that he went to the other side and, and this being of light was waiting for him. And the being of light said, would you like to see a movie reel basically of the highlights of your life? And he said, yes, I would. And it was a really short reel. It only showed him um, showing his son how to swing a baseball bat and dancing with his daughter at, at her wedding. And he's like, well, what about when I brought my company public? And what about when I did that? He goes, you did those things to glorify yourself. Because on the other side, like it's all about service, right? Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you doing what you're doing to uplift people, to serve people, to share your knowledge with people? Because you know that what you have is so valuable and it could change their financial future. You know, that's the intention behind what we do. But um, this guy, the, the being of light said, you just did it all to glorify you. And then the being of light said, would you like to see the life of someone who has also just passed over? And he said, well, yeah, I would. And in the book, it said these curtains of golden light parted and they're sitting on a throne of light surrounded by a host of angels was the woman who used to clean this man's house, who took two or three buses just to scrub his toilets. And he and so the the um, being of light starts showing the highlights of this woman's life. And it was an endless reel. It showed her carrying a pot of soup to a sick friend. It showed her comforting a child who's, who had been bullied. It showed her stroking her mother's hair as her mother is making her transition. It showed her just going to church and hugging everybody up and saying, how you doing today? And mm -hmm. then the being of light turned to the man and said, when you get here, you discover that the only thing that matters while you're on earth is how much love you give. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I just went back on the couch and loved up my kids and stayed there for another 15 years. Well, not on the couch for 15 years, but <laughs> <laughs> and I put away, you know, Napoleon Hill and Wallace Waddles and Clement Stone. And I learned from my two greatest gurus. And those are the gurus who call me mom. And um, I continue to learn from those gurus. Today. Right. Yes, they are the endless teachers. That is for sure. Oh, and we still do our service wherever we can. I got a call. I got an email, not even a call, a few hours ago. Your flight is canceled. This is my flight on Thursday, where I'm supposed to be speaking at a leadership conference on Thursday evening. And I've got everything all laid out perfectly. And my wife says, OK, um, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I got to get there somehow. And so now it's the 5.40 a.m. flight going the wrong direction to then get on the five-hour flight coming all the way back this way in the middle seat because there wasn't any amount of money that could buy you a better seat than the middle seat from five hours from Charlotte, North Carolina, all the way to L.A. in order to make it on time to serve the people that I'm serving on Thursday evening. And I'm very much looking forward to my middle seat all the way from Charlotte to LAX. <laughs> and that's the thing, you know, attitude is everything. And you know, this is a little bit, well, it's not really off subject. You know, the truth is, is that um, it's scientifically verified that you change your life. You can even change your body by changing your thoughts. You can even create the health of your body. I've been reading um, so many articles about uh, even COVID because, because physical health is so much on people's minds right now. I just wanna share a little bit of research and um, about how our physical bodies can not only, or our attitude or the way we think about our physical bodies can not only increase our disease fighting white blood cells and lower the level of 
uh, the hormone that raises blood pressure, but it, your thoughts can even reverse heart disease, strengthen your bones, regrow brain cells that, you know, our brains actually physically shrink beginning at age 27. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that it, it re reaches the peaks of growth, but there's a woman, I don't know if you ever heard of her, Alyssa Apple, and she's, she was a professor, she still is, of psychiatry at the University of California in San Francisco, and she conducted a study of 159 people who had been diagnosed with HIV, and they were randomly assigned exercises intended to foster optimism and other positive emotions. I actually read this in the New York Times, and it said that People with diagnosis of HIV who practice optimism and were um, looked for the good and looked for the silver lining carried a lower load of the HIV virus and were less likely to need antidepressants to help them cope with their illness than those who just continued to live their lives randomly expressing negativity. And then they extended the research and they found similar results with patients suffering from breast cancer and diabetes and even dementia. And um, it was also discovered that thinking positively and being optimistic even slowed the aging of the brain and the body. And there is actually one other um, research uh, piece that they cited in the Times, and it was like 4,000 people um, who uh, were, I think, 50 or over, and they um, and they were also instructed they had to be optimistic, and it lowered what's called C-reactive protein, which is a marker of stress-related inflammation and other illness. But what's so crazy about that is that with COVID, what I'm reading now, you're probably reading the same thing, is that the more afraid people are of COVID, the more likely they are to get it because fear actually reduces your physiological resistance to disease, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you look for the good and the optimistic, then, um, wait, there's one other study. Oh, I know what it was. It was Trindell. I'm like, I have all these studies in my mind because I also teach anti-aging and, and we talk about these, uh, these um, uh, research pieces in our anti-aging course. But um, in one study, there's a researcher named Trindell 97,000 women filled out questionnaires. Um, it was the National Institute of Health study trying to correlate optimism and mortality. And women who scored high on optimism, being hopeful about the future and canceling negative thoughts significantly reduced their rates of heart disease, cancer, mm -hmm. and early death than people who scored high on pessimism. And also cynicism, people who were described as un, you know, being always thinking that people were not trustworthy or even dangerous, they tended to live um, shorter and have um, more poor health than people who looked at people with love and expected the best from people. So mm -hmm. what I say about that is if you don't want to live with fear, if you don't want to live with pessimism, stop watching all of the reports about COVID and all of the deaths and the counter going up and up and up and this variant and that variant, because the more afraid you are, the more you weaken your body's own immunity. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that, because it is such a challenging time for so many people out there. How can we remain optimistic in this negative world that we're facing? At least, at least there are there's so much negativity that comes at you on a constant basis. Because I don't feel like I live in a negative world, but I am very aware that there's a lot of it that you're <laughs> bobbing and weaving. Well, you do what you do. Stay away from negative people. Number one, because attitudes are contagious, and everything is energy. I mean, you know, you go into a friend's house and they just had an argument. And even though they're not arguing anymore, you could feel it. It's in the air. And it actually is in the air. There's scientific research that's been done on that too. And have you noticed that, and, and I'm ask, asking, asking your listeners, have you noticed more and more how you feel like 
you don't want to be around negative people. You don't want to be in their energy field because they pull you down and you're, you guys are going places, right? If you're in this community, you have big dreams, you have big aspirations, but the doom and gloom society, they pull you down because energy evens out. So number one, don't, don't be around those people because their thoughts affect you. By the way, I was going to share with you. I don't know if you ever heard my near death experience, but I saw this phenomenon with my own eye in that space between life and death. Did I ever share with you my near death experience? Well, no. And I think you need to, because I want to know, but so is everybody else that's watching or listening to this. Oh yeah. Everybody. No, okay. You don't have to cover your ears while I just tell it to Ridgely. You can all listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is about five years ago. Um, I don't get sick. I just, I don't get sick. I don't do that thing. And if I do feel a little thing coming on, scratchy throat, whatever, I'll just, you know, electrolytes and vitamin C and echinacea and golden seal, boom, bam, it's gone before it takes hold of my body. And, but one day about five years ago, I had that scratchy throat. I did my thing. And I got sicker. And the next day I was sicker. And the next day I was sicker is on a Monday. By Saturday, I was lying in bed and I was thinking, I could die here. I live by myself. I could die and I'd be one of those, you know, situations where they find me days later. So I did what any intelligent person would do. I called my local healer and I said, <laughs> um, I think I'm really sick. Can you help me? And he said, I will help you, but you have to promise me you'll do exactly what I tell you to do. And I said, anything. He said, call 911 immediately because <laughs> he long distance healer could see that it was not good. So I couldn't even do it at that point. I said, you do it for me. So he called the, the ambulance, the ambulance came, the paramedics, they had to break down the door to come in and, um, or break the lock to come in. And um, they, uh, at that time, my blood pressure was actually 52 over 28, incompatible with life. And um, so they asked me what hospital I wanted to go to. And I whispered, Evanston, they didn't have time to get me there. It was about 11 minutes away. So they took me to a little hospital around the corner. I went into the emergency room and they start hooking me up to every machine and every whatever imaginable. And it didn't look good. It, it turned out that I had a sepsis. And if you have one deadly bacteria in your blood, you have about 50% chance of living. I had two. I had just come back from a developing country. Apparently, I picked up two deadly bacteria that were floating around my bloodstream. So I'm lying there and um, I start to go to the other side. And I noticed that when my eyes were open, I could see everybody rushing around the room trying to save my life. But when my eyes were closed, I could not only see everybody rushing around the room trying to save my life, but I could also see that there was this white light that was actually guiding every movement of the doctor's hands, the nurse's hands, everybody there. It was guided by this intelligence that manifested as a white light. And I'm thinking, you know how we say there are no mistakes in the universe? I'm thinking, oh my goodness, there are really no mistakes in the universe. And, <laughs> and, and I remember when one of the nurses was trying to you know, hook the IV bag on the hook and she fumbled it and dropped it on the gurney. And um, everybody like shot her these looks like you clumsy oaf. But I saw that when she bent her head down to pick it up, her head moved away from some of the monitors and another nurse went, oh my goodness, and went and made an adjustment that saved my life. So yeah. I could see yeah. that everything is orchestrated, you know, like the cogs on a fine tuned watch. And then something even more amazing happened. So by that time, my, my um, then husband, that was husband number two, but we weren't together anymore. I've had a bunch, but we weren't actually, I'll make it, but we weren't together anymore either, but um, we were still very, very, very good friends. And um, the healer had called him and said, told him to get his butt over to the hospital. And so um, he was there and it didn't look good. It looked like I was going. And um, I saw this nurse go over to him, put her hand on his shoulder and say, don't worry, she's going to be fine. And in that place between life and death, I saw the word she's going to be fine come out of her mouth, accompanied by this sparkly pink light. It looked like a little my little pony rainbow, like da -da. it went out of her mouth into my body and the words, she's going to be fine, 
gave life to every cell in my body. And I'm like, oh my goodness, your words do create your reality. What mm -hmm. I've been teaching for three decades, almost four, is the truth. Your words have the power over life and death. And then the doctor came in, saw what was going on, with a very gruff voice said, get that blood pressure up. We are losing her. And the words came out of his mouth, went into my body. And I saw they were cut, they were coming by this like brown gray gunk. It even smelled, it smelled like a swamp in that place, you know, that horrible, you know, that putrid smell went into my body and took all of my strength away. And at that moment, I made a deal with God. I said, God, the God of my understanding, please let me live. Because not only will I tell everybody the power of their own thoughts, but the power of other people's thoughts and words about you. And then I upped the ante and I said to the God of my understanding, if you let me live, I promise I will tell everybody this, that they shouldn't say negative things about other people. And I promise I will never say anything negative about my children or anybody again. I will never say, oh, Daniel's this and Deanna's this and da, da, da. Because I realized that my saying it was causing it for them. If I said, oh, Daniel's lazy, which he's not, but I just, it's not anything I would ever say about that kid. But for example, if you say that about your kid, that is going into them and causing them to be that way so anyway i get a little excited about this the truth is um well the good news is i lived <laughs> yes we see that we're, we're that part's clear right and the other good news is is that i am so clear about the power of our words and our thoughts are even more powerful just like the molecule is powerful but the atom is more powerful and the electrons and protons and neutrons are even more powerful and the quarks are even more powerful so our thoughts are even more powerful than our words. Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. There you go. And what a great story it is. I'll tell you, those near death experiences are legit. I had one of those two, same situation, picked up a parasite in Thailand and was slowly dying, slowly dying, sleeping first 15 hours, then 18 hours a day, then 20 hours a day, then whatever. And somebody said to me, you need to go see this little Chinese woman who's going to give you a colonic and you're going to see, and I'm in there and, and she's watching stuff go through the tubes. It's not pretty. Right. And she says, okay, I got it. I know exactly what you need. And she said, you're going to go to your doctor and you're going to say, this is what I have. This is what you need to give me. You need to take 10 days off because it's going to knock you out for the next 10 days. And that's exactly what happened. And 10 days after that, I emerged and here we are. So, you know, you pay attention. It's that little Chinese woman over there that knew something that everybody else, every doctor that I went to couldn't yeah. figure it out. The little Chinese yeah. woman. And that's like my healer. You know, I would yeah. have just said, oh, can you heal me? And he's like, uh, get your butt to the hospital. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> because they can see things that other people can't. And again, it goes back to we were each given a gift. We were each given a dharma. He was given a dharma to be a healer. I, I, I'm not given a dharma as a healer, but um, thank goodness there are people who are following their calling and not giving up at the sign of the first obstacle. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I know that our time is kind of getting towards the end, but I just want to introduce one more concept, if that's okay. <laughs> I know, I keep asking you for permission. Okay, <laughs> I know it's okay. Okay, because so, this just ha happened into my mind, and I think that it's probably somebody needs to hear it, that, you know, we did not appear in this world by chance. We did not appear through a process of random selection. We appeared for a reason. And the reason is we each have Dharma to fulfill and also what's called in Kabbalah, you know, the Jewish mystical text, Tikkun, T-I-K-K-U-N, which means correct or repair. We came into this lifetime because our, there are some corrections we have to make so we don't have to incarnate again. Kabbalah teaches us that we come with baggage from previous lifetimes and it, you know, it contains the places where we short circuited our, our lives and we all have, and I'll tell you what our tacoons are. 
It's whatever is tough for you. Okay. Some people have an easy time with money, but they have a terrible time with relationships. Somebody has a terrible time saying no. Somebody has a hard time speaking up for themselves. Somebody thinks it's good enough to go through life being a nice, nice guy, but you're always being taken advantage of. We know, and you know what else is part of your tacoon? That person that keeps showing up in your life, the boss that keeps showing up in a different body until you get the lesson, right? So yeah. whatever is uncomfortable for you, maybe it's a, a spouse that keeps showing up in a different body. All the people in, the, in your life who bother you, who annoy you, they're part of your tacoon. You know, every unloyal boyfriend or girlfriend. Again, if you find it hard to speak up for yourself, that's part of your tacoon. If you can't seem to get out of debt, that's part of your tacoon. If it's difficult to control your negative thoughts, it's part of your tacoon. If you make messes, if you're late all the time, if you seem to generate conflict around you, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. it is, that's what you came here for. And I'm telling you, if one of those situations, if it appears in your life and you know it's your tacoon, you know what it's came. I know what mine is. I, I know this is hard to believe, but I have always had a hard time speaking up for myself. <clears throat> I don't like conflict. So if I speak up for myself, God forbid, there might be a conflict or I might hurt somebody's feelings, right? Excuse me. <clears throat> but these situations are your greatest gift. Because what happens is that when you face your tacoons, instead of running away from them, when you run towards what makes you uncomfortable, I mean, the momentary relief of avoiding is nothing compared to the spiritual gain you'll experience. I remember Sherry Shepard, when she was voted off Dancing with the Stars, one of my other favorite shows, <clears throat> she said, thank you so much for letting me live a dream I've always had. And I want to say to everyone, that thing that scares you the most, that makes you say, I don't know if I could do it. I'm so scared. Run towards it. It gives me goosebumps, mm -hmm. she said, because it's so amazing on the other side. Mm -hmm. So what I say to everybody is that run towards those things that scare you. And what you're going to find is that if you run towards it with the attitude of gratitude, thank you for the situation being in my life. Thank you for this gift, because I know when I run towards it, the, the real grace of all of the um, forces of nature, all of the forces on heaven and earth, all of the grace is waiting there to catch you. But if you keep running away from it, you know, it's not going to get easier. First, it's going to be the, you know, the um, quintessential nudge and then the two by four and then the Mack truck. Don't let it sit next time. And you know what? It is never as hard as you think it's going to be. And the rewards are so great. And I'll tell you one other, um, one other thing that you can think about when people say, but I can't do it. I just can't. If I gave you a million dollars to do it, could you do it? <laughs> could you face the tough stuff? Could you tell your spouse you want a divorce? Could you tell your boss that you want to raise? If I would hand you a million dollars to do it, would you do it? And the answer is, yeah. You would go get up every morning. If every time you face a jacoon, you got a million dollars. If you got 10 grand. You got a grand. You'd probably run around looking for your tacoons. So don't say you can't do it. I know that you can. And the spiritual gain, the spiritual reward is worth so much more than any amount of money because that's what we came here for. That's exactly right. Thank you so much, Deborah. And I know before you go, you have a little something for the folks who want to get a little more Deborah, which I hope is pretty much everybody, right? <laughs> so tell us about that real quick so we can uh, make a little bit more of Deborah available to all. Yes. Well, remember when I said that I had a, uh, my Yes to Success book, that's the name of my company, Yes to Success. My Yes to Success book was in the hands of a New York publisher. Um, and then I decided to stay home with the kids. Well, ever since then, I have had people ask me, 
when are you going to write the book? When are you going to write the book? When are you going to write the book? And <laughs> the answer is, I'm probably not. But what I decided to do is I decided to take the five most important concepts in that book and put it into an ebook and give it to everybody. So I am doing that right now. It's called The Five Secrets to a Life of True Success. And it is really good if I do say so myself. Lots of stories, <laughs> sure even that. pictures, pictures of my son, pictures. I mean, it's really pictures of Marcy and me. I mean, there are lots of pictures. But most importantly, I really believe that these, if you could just live these five secrets that I share in the book, I can almost guarantee that your dreams will come true. So I'm telling everybody in the Groove Growth community, if you happen to be listening as opposed to watching, go into Groove Member and on that button directly below this fabulous, amazing, incredible hour that we've just spent, click on the button and you'll be able to get that very generous gift from Deborah. Five secrets that you need to find out about. So if you're watching, click the button below. If you're listening, go into Groove Member, go into Groove Growth, and click the button below this interview with Deborah. Deborah, you know I love you so much. You're just absolutely amazing and complete inspiration. Every time I spend time with you, it's just like, oh, she's just incredible. So. <laughs> And I just want to say it's something you do for people, because I remember when I spoke at Mark Porteous's event, and there you were in the back room, just smiling the entire time. You're being who you are, just being Ridgely, you are such a gift, besides all your brilliance and all of the ways that you help people uh, become successful, but just you being you is such a gift to this planet. It's true. Well. Thank you very much. Very thoughtful words. I appreciate that a lot. Deborah, I love you a ton. Thank you so much from the entire Groove Growth community, Groove Digital, everybody, the Groovesters and Groove Stars that are out there. We all just say thank you, thank you, thank you very much.